Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 16th of January, and this is Govindraj Ethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital, rejoicing after experiencing an inexplicably clear day and thus low pollution levels on Monday, where we could actually see beyond our noses. Our top stories and themes for the day. The stock markets hit fresh highs as information technology stocks stage a dramatic turnaround. Traders are now betting that the rupee will rise this year against the dollar. Mayhem at airports and airline passengers losing it. Who is to blame? And India's automobile exports fell 21% last year. Exports rose last month. This is a core report with Govindraj Ethiraj. Stock markets hit new highs. The markets hit all-time highs, but the most unexpected turnaround in the markets were in the information technology stocks. The same bunch the street seemed to have almost given up on, but then again changed their minds overnight as Q3 results started coming in. And more on that in a bit. The BSC Sensex, helped of course by the IT stocks, crossed the 73,000 mark for the first time, hitting a lifetime high of 73,402 and closing at 73,328, up 759 points. The Nifty 52 touched a new peak of 22,116 but ended up at 22,097. That's 22,097, up 203 points. Now, the stock price of Wipro surged almost 14% intraday before closing 6% higher as the company beat profit estimates in its third quarter results. The Nifty IT index rose for the second straight trading day, quoting near its two-year high of 37,929 as it jumped 4% on the National Stock Exchange in Monday's intraday trade. Elsewhere, Reuters is reporting that investors are betting that India's rupee will break out of its narrow range and rally this year. Volumes in the dollar-rupee options market have surged in the first few trading days of 2024 and the direction of these trades shows or suggests that market participants expect the rupee to rise, breaking out of that narrow range of last year. The rupee on Monday climbed to 82 rupees 78 paise to the US dollar, the highest in more than four months. It's also gained marginally in January, even as other major Asian currencies have fallen, all bite slightly. So the Reserve Bank of India's control, and I'm using that word a little carefully, of the rupee last year drew criticism from the International Monetary Fund, which reclassified India's currency regime to that of a stabilized arrangement from floating in December. A hedge fund portfolio manager told Reuters that the bets on the rupees rise is based on the belief that the frequency of Reserve Bank's intervention will come off following that IMF's criticism. This could mean that the rupee could break out of last year's range, which was, of course, the narrowest since 2002. Now, how much, of course, is tough to say, though the rupee's volatility was amongst the lowest in Asia last year, presumably because it was being managed in that form. I reached out to Anuj Gupta, head of commodities and currencies at HDFC Securities, and I began by asking him how he was interpreting the rupee's recent strength. You know, one month we have seen uh, appreciation in rupee and Rupees now trading at four month high level. One reason was the depreciation or correction in dollar index. And the second one was the step taken by the RBI. RBI is always managing the rupee, giving some cool to importer and exporters. So in that way, we have seen from last four months, it was on a flat range around, it was hovered around 83.30 kind of level. But now it is, you know, appreciating and even the supply, a dollar supply was the RBI. That is the one of the reasons that RBI is selling the dollar. This is giving some coal to the Indian rupee. And recently we have seen that the forex reserve declined sharply by 5.89 billion. Again, a part that RBI is selling a dollar to give some coolness to the Indian rupee. How are things looking ahead? I mean, so the speculation seems to be, at least going by some reports, including in Reuters, that... Traders are betting that, you know, the rupee will appreciate this year because the Reserve Bank is going to take a step back. Do you see that happening, first of all, or do you see that the rupee continuing to be managed as it was in the last year, where it was amongst the most least volatile currencies? Yeah, actually, definitely when the rupee appreciate or depreciate, RBI is always taking a step to control the rupee. You know, this is the actually basic function which is, you know, doing by the RBI. So because our economy is totally based on import and export. 
So giving the cool stuff to the importer and exporter, are we also, you know, buying or selling the dollar whenever they feel. So definitely this year would be again an election year. And again, we have seen a big geopolitical tension from the last couple of years, almost a Russia-Ukraine war, then Hamas and Israel war. The important part is that correction in the crude oil prices and correction in the natural gas prices. Last year, we have seen a sharp rally in crude oil and sharp rally in natural gas prices. So because we have a very big basket in crude oil import. So this will again provide some coolness. But the cautious approach is that the prices of pulses, I think this year might be a little bit, give some tension or you can say some botherness to the government. Because this year we have seen a less production on the pulses. So pulses will, you know, whenever we do any import of the pulses, so this will impact on rupee. But yes, coolness in crude oil, because currently crude oil is trading around 70 and as per the City Bank report, crude oil expected to trade between $60 to $50. This will again be a part for the positive part for the Indian economy. I think this year we can see some strength in rupee as compared to the last year. So when you say strength in the rupee, so you're saying that it could go stronger than the 82.80 or 82.50 range that we have seen for the last year? Definitely, we can see between 82.50 to 82 levels. The one reason is that FOMC is also, you know, will start to reduce the interest rate by the March or April. So this will also provide the coolness to the Indian rupee as dollar index is also correcting from the high of 107 to 101 kind of level. And we're expecting that dollar index after the, the FOMC will cut the interest rate, it may test below 100 point of level and even bond yields is also on a downside. So this will uh, provide the support to the all major currencies. So due to this, we can see some strength in Indian rupee. And I am expecting that it may test 82 kind of level. But broadly, if you see, we can say that rupee may trade between 81 to 85 level. But yes, in a very near term, we can see that it can it may test 82, 50 to 82 levels. All right, Anuj, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Oil falls as perception of tensions in the Middle East ease off. Oil edged lower as the risk that airstrikes by the United States and its allies against the Houthi rebels in Yemen would ignite a larger and wider conflict and also disrupt crude flows from the Middle East seem to have eased off despite missiles flying in both directions. Brent crude was trading below $78 a barrel or close to $77.50 as equities dipped and the dollar gained, making commodities priced in the currency less attractive, Bloomberg reported. So the markets are basically focused on clues on interest rates ahead of speeches by policymakers at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week, from which we will hopefully have more tomorrow. While the global benchmark, that's Brent crude, was up more than 4% at one point on Friday, which in turn led to speculation, as we reported here as well, that prices would start shooting up, it ended the session with a gain of just 1.1%. To reiterate, the prices suggest that the markets are not expecting the conflict in the Middle East to escalate or expand and affect crude oil production, including the transporting of it through the Red Sea, which has seen an unexpected hurdle or series of hurdles thanks to those missile attacks by Houthi rebels. Bloomberg reported that at least three oil tanker owners, which between them marshal more than 350 vessels, said on Friday they were pausing voyages through the southern Red Sea into, obviously, the Suez Canal. More are likely to follow suit after advice from Western military forces that all ships should stay away from that area. But on the supply side, the TAPs are said to be opened wider, including from non-organization of petroleum exporting countries. Combine that with slowing demand growth, as we've been discussing here, and prices are thus steady. On Monday, back home, we spoke to the Oil India Limited chairman, Ranjit Rath, who provided a geological landscape of India's prospects in oil, both onshore and offshore. And now, the Oil and Natural Gas Commission, also government-owned, like Oil India Limited, has made two significant back-to-back natural gas discoveries in the Mahanadi Basin deepwater block in the Bay of Bengal, according to the Press Trust of India. The discoveries have been made in an area which was previously classified as a no-go because of national security. The first discovery, named Utkal, is in 714 meters of water depth, and the second is at a depth of 1,110 meters. 
the ONGC has notified these discoveries to the regulator and is now apparently doing commercial viability assessments. India imports roughly half of its gas needs and is targeting raising the share of natural gas in its energy basket to 15% by 2030 from the current roughly 6%. And obviously, all of this domestic production, as it when it starts flowing, will help, according to the PTI. So the natural gas that would be extracted from wells like this could generate electricity, make fertilizers, or turn into compressed natural gas, which could in turn be used to run automobiles, as we see in India, and piped to household kitchens for cooking purposes. The energy segment was brought to you by India Energy Week to happen on February 6th in Goa. For more details, log on to www.indiaenergyweek.com. India's trade deficit narrows. India's merchandise trade deficit narrowed to about 19.8 billion in December 2023 compared to 23 billion in the same month last year, according to the Commerce Ministry of India on Monday. After contracting for a few months, exports of goods has now turned positive, coming in at about $38.45 billion in December 2023 compared to about $38 billion in the same month last year, whereas merchandise imports fell about 5%. Some company news, Tata Consumer Products, a company that owns Tetley Tea among other brands, will acquire Capital Foods, owner of the brand's Ching Secret, which is also the maker of desi or local Chinese flavorings for Chinese food, that is, and another brand called Smith & Jones. The second acquisition is Organic India, a company that sells organic herbal teas and health foods. The value of the first deal, that's Capital Foods and Ching Secret, the brands that come under it, is 5,100 crore rupees and Organic India will be bought for 1,900 crore rupees. So the food segments here are quite different, though both represent strong domestic brands built over several years, pretty much from scratch. More importantly, the deal represents consolidation in the branded foods space with relatively smaller players selling out to a large global brand, in this case being Tata Consumers. Mayhem at Indian airports and the failure to communicate. A year ago, I had the not-so-good fortune of flying Air India non-stop from New York to New Delhi. I shouldn't have worried so much, because apart from broken seats and a barely functional and even less visible entertainment system, everything else worked fine. The aircraft took off on time and landed earlier than scheduled, as often happens with eastbound flights. And finally, it was a perfect landing, with the wheels barely kissing the runway and settling down. It was almost like a machine was flying the aircraft. Actually, it may have well been a machine, because from start to end on that 14-hour flight, I did not hear any voice from the cockpit unless it happened at some dark hour I was sleeping. Highly unlikely though. I do think I vaguely heard someone ask the crew to prepare for landing when we were landing, but I couldn't be sure because the voice sounded pretty garbled and could have come from anywhere. So, the pilot or pilots did not speak, period. For a pilot to remain incommunicado for such a long flight and time was very unusual, if not disconcerting, at least for me. I checked with a pilot friend later if that was normal. According to him, Air India pilots were notorious for giving the silent treatment to their passengers. Though most airlines, he said, did not really mandate how much or any announcements the pilot should make because their job, after all, is to fly the aircraft and not keep chatting away with the passengers. But pilots do communicate. I have found pilots being quite instructive on several Western carriers or even domestic flights and chatty, particularly if there are delays building up. On some domestic US flights, I have found pilots updating almost every 5 to 10 minutes sometimes. Anyway, our theme today is communication and not the art of flying an aircraft. Back home, fog-induced delays, sometimes even 12 hours, are causing considerable angst across the country in the last two days. One man charged to the front and hit an Indigo pilot after being strapped in, I would imagine, for several hours. He was promptly arrested for his efforts. Before I come to the delays, a reminder that air traffic has hit all-time highs in India. The country saw its highest ever domestic traffic in a single month in December with about 14 million passengers, a new high surpassing the pre-pandemic peaks. The number of aircraft are less for various reasons as many are grounded, so more people per aircraft, though my sense is that the absolute number may be a little less in January as it's not as peak in terms of travel as December. But obviously that's completely overwhelmed 
by the fact that we've had massive fog-induced delays emanating from Delhi. So all in all, highly combustible situations. Delays, of course, happen everywhere in the world and nowhere in the world are unruly or violent passengers condoned. As a matter of fact, all jurisdictions seem to respond similarly as an unruly or violent passenger is seen as being dangerous to the safety of hundreds of other passengers and crew. So that is not the point. The point is, however, communication. It's quite clear by looking at the multiple incidents in the last few days in Delhi and other cities in India that airlines are failing spectacularly in communicating to passengers. Not only do they not communicate, but they seem to lack a standard SOP or standard operating procedure for doing so, something the aviation minister said in a Twitter post would be addressed. As a reasonably frequent flyer, I can testify to a complete lack of consistency in the manner of announcements when there are delays. Often, silence seems to be the best recourse and announcements when made seem to be done almost grudgingly. Looking back at the last few days of mayhem, if there's one lesson airlines should learn is to communicate, communicate and communicate at all levels, including by pilots when stuck on the tarmac, because pilots' voices are definitely reassuring even if no one is going nowhere. So I reached out to Captain Sam Thomas, president of the Airline Pilots Association of India and a commercial pilot himself. And I began by asking him what was his takeaway from the last few days of mayhem, including violence against pilots like him. Communications, like you said, is the key. Unfortunately, not all pilots are gifted with the art of communication or the art of speaking for that matter. We are happy doing this mechanical skill, landing and taking off airplanes, the moment you ask us to come out of our uh, domain and start speaking, it starts to create a little bit of an issue. Now, having said that, I'd like to point out with this particular case in uh, view that we are facing right now, we seem to wake up anytime there is an incident and then talk about it. Three aspects that are bringing these kind of issues to the forefront. Firstly, the profile of the passengers traveling on low-cost airlines. Secondly, with Indigo in particular, the indoctrination of staff that is leading to a lot of theatrics. And we must tell you that along in when you indulge in theatrics, brickbats come along with bouquets. Third is the social media outreach that is happening and every incident is blown out of proportion. And also, it creates a lot of WhatsApp university chancellors, aviation experts, and everybody seems to value their time more than the other person's time. Now, also, you must understand the complexity of the delays that happen. They are not something that can be explained in a finite amount of time. And you very rightly said that communication is the issue. Now, in our country, our slogan is Satyameva Jayate, but we never seem to speak the truth ever in case of, I mean, our first resort is to tell some kind of falsified information. This happens with the ground staff. This happens with the cabin crew. This happens with the pilots and with the other management as well. Now, not entirely due to their fault. Like I said, the complexity of delays and the, the information flow that follows that is not the most robust at all times. Right. And, you know, there are obviously three or four stages. The final stage is the cockpit. We're talking about the cockpit because we've seen a case of violence in the aircraft after doors were shut, I'm assuming, against the pilot of the aircraft. So that's one part of it. But even before people actually enter the aircraft, there seems to be a lot of mishandling in terms of communication again. Now, in your mind, why isn't, or one is, where is the responsibility to be, you know, from a passenger's point of view, where does the responsibility lie? Second is, what do we do to fix this, at least this part of it, the communication part of it? I wish it was that easy, but communication is one thing that is never taught to any of these people. Be it the most sales-oriented communication or information that is provided to the ground staff and more information regarding basics that are departure times, arrival times, and stuff like that. But when there is a crisis situation, like I said, if you have a set of passengers traveling to London on a business conference, you will find very dignified set which will try and understand, which also knows that you are doing your best, and this is the information that you are able to give to them. Firstly, the staff at the gate get the information last. So at some times, they 
make up their own information based on their previous experience and in india particularly we have this irate passengers issue where once again the profile of the passenger traveling on a low cost airline is questionable at best now the first resort that they do first rather reaction that we have is screaming and yelling and some justified some not justified and in response you have counter screaming from the staff and once this is moved on to the airplane there is also an inherent fear of flying for these profile of passengers because everybody seems to i mean that inherent fear has always been there and it's very difficult for a fearful person to be keeping quiet about something if he screams out he probably feels he's doing his this one you see the same clip the followed that assault was the guy seemed to be absolutely decent when he came down from the airplane so this is another aspect that comes out as far as communication specialized communication for crisis management has to be there and that has to percolate all the way down to the counter staff failing which we will see repeat of these kind of incidents so let me come back to the cockpit now i mean again in my experience there is no consistency and you did say that you know pilots are not specifically taught what or how to communicate because that's not their primary job but i do see in some cases pilots are extremely articulate they're constantly sharing they're keeping you posted and that helps because as a passenger hearing the captain's voice is any day more reassuring than let's say a cabin crew so what do you feel can be done as someone who is heading a pilots union to maybe make things a little better firstly we should have realistic scenarios and this should be inculcated in the annual refresher for every pilot firstly like i said earlier not all of them are suave speakers so we customize announcements and give them realistic scenarios to speak like you rightly said some of these pilots should have been rjs on djs they can speak very eloquently and you know they can even play a couple of cds for you there and make it a very worthwhile experience but not all of them are like that and the minority that can speak eloquently also the tone matters now without any training only the highly talented can have a tone that's reassuring and tone that has some amount of authority and reassuring kind of messages can be delivered so this has to be inculcated into the annual refresher to make a start there are excellent communicators or trainers in communication that are there in the corporate world they should be incorporated or rather asked to help out to help the not just the pilots alone the cabin crew as well now in the low cost airlines cost is of as the definition suggests cost is of the greatest importance therefore you tend to in the cabin employ people who are not very expensive to hire now that has its own challenges and being india such a vast so we have different accents what we think in punjabi and speak to you in english that could have or you know for that matter once you think in malayalam and speak in english it has a different connotation altogether so these are the challenges we are facing and i think we should bring in corporate communicators to start tutoring the pilots in a very small way or staff in general captain thomas thank you so much for joining me was welcome thank you govard meanwhile the new delhi airport has been asked to expedite the operationalization of its cat 3 enabled fourth runway that can handle flights during adverse weather india's aviation minister said on monday and relevant to our discussion just now regulator director general of civil aviation will issue standard operating procedures for airline to minimize passenger discomfort due to flight cancellations and delays the aviation minister said on twitter automobile exports fall and looking at the big picture numbers This is not so much about the fact that automobile exports have fallen yes it is to some extent but that how looking at month to month figures can distract us from the bigger picture now this happens in several categories including goods and service tax collections which are of course strong but they've not risen as spectacularly as you might be thinking if you were to step back and look at a one year graph as opposed to reading the one month headlines So to come to auto exports now shipments from India have declined 21% last year as per the latest Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers Association's data 
Interestingly, passenger vehicle shipments rose 5%, but other segments like commercial vehicles, two-wheelers and three-wheelers saw substantial declines in exports last year. Two-wheeler exports dropped 20%, while three-wheeler exports declined 30%. Last year may have been a bit of an aberration since there was pent-up demand in markets like South Africa and the Gulf region, said the Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers, whereas two- and three-wheeler markets are seeing subdued demand for domestic reasons, that's domestic reasons in their countries. India's larger exporters include the Japanese and Korean companies like Maruti Suzuki and Hyundai and Kia Motors. On that note of looking at data from a big picture point of view or taking a step back quite simply, have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core dot in. And thank you once again for listening.